obviously other historical objections we could get into, but we, we've covered the, the bulk of the major ones. And again, I get into a bit more of this in, in volume one, the second part of answering Jewish objections to Jesus. We, we now want to look at theological objections, and this, this is what I cover in volume two. Uh, also in my book, The Real Kosher Jesus, I have sections that deal with some of these theological objections, and I, I try to take them up even from a different angle there to further simplify them. These can be more complex, the nature of God, triunity, deity of Messiah, personhood of the Holy Spirit, the nature of sin, the nature of salvation, the need for atonement. These are some of the major themes. And, and then some that will tie in later with New Testament objections that, uh, that Yeshua or Paul abolished the Torah. But right now we're going to concentrate on the nature of God, the nature of atonement, and, and look at those as the primary theological objections we get into, and then we'll look at some smaller ones uh, along the way. The, the first fundamental objection would be this. Jews don't believe in the Trinity. Jews believe in one God, not three. I personally don't use the word Trinity a lot, especially in dealing with Jews, for two reasons. One, it's, it's not found in the New Testament itself. There are plenty of terms of use that are not found directly in Scripture. So that leads to number two, which is it can bring misconception, especially to Jews. I will speak of God's triunity, so that it's clear we're talking about one God, His triunity, or His complex unity. And, and complex unity is a term that, to me, aptly describes God the way He reveals Himself to us in our Bible, in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Scriptures. So... I'm sure there are Christians who misunderstand what Jews believe. Well, the same way there are Jews who misunderstand what Christians, what Messianic Jews believe. So we categorically need to explain we believe in one God, not three. One God and one God only. This is affirmed in the Hebrew Scriptures. This is reaffirmed in the New Testament as well. So we, we want to emphasize that as clearly as we can, and we want to say that this God whom we worship is complex in his unity. He revealed himself to us through his son, the Messiah. He works among us and touches us by his spirit, but he is one God. Now, here's a doctrinal confession signed by Church of England clergy. There is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body, parts, or passions, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible. This is Church of England clergy. This is not some Messianic Jewish apologist arguing this. Church of England clergy reaffirming one God, one God only. Uh, traditional Jews will refer to the, the God of Scripture, the God of Jewish tradition, as the Ein Sof, the infinite one, the endless one. And we have to recognize that God transcends human categories in many ways. You, you say, but, but hang on, hang on. He is echad. Traditional Jews know this. They, they say this with their eyes closed to focus intensely on his unity. Traditional Jews are urged to, to, to focus on the oneness of God, his unity, day and night. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. So how can a central tenet of the Christian Messianic Jewish faith be that God is complex in his unity or that God is a triunity if the most fundamental tenet of the Jewish faith is that God is Echad? Well, very simple answer to that. Echad in and of itself does not mean absolute singularity. You say, it means compound unity? No, in and of itself, it just means one. And, and this is something we absolutely agree on. Now, there are Jewish translations that understand Deuteronomy 6 for the Shema differently. There are Jewish interpreters that understand it differently and would translate it like this. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. The Lord Echad, that one alone. In other words, Moses was not making a statement 
a, a philosophical statement about the nature of God. He was saying Yahweh alone is our God. He was also saying he alone, meaning there's not a Yahweh here and then a different Yahweh there and a different Yahweh there. Like you have some of the different gods, regional or per city or things like that. No, no, he and he alone. Isn't that the major message of the prophets? Worship God and worship God alone. Isn't that a major theme in the Ten Commandments? Don't worship any other gods. Isn't that a major theme through the Torah? Don't worship any other gods. There, there's even a, a Jewish tradition, a midrash, a homiletical application. That as Jacob is dying, he, he, he senses, wait, wait, wait there. I sense idolatry among some of my sons. And they turn to him and say, Shema Yisrael, Israel, our father, Jacob, Israel, our father, hear us. The Lord, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh alone, we're not worshiping any other God. So this idea that the text is making a statement about the nature of God, that he is echad, as, as opposed to two or three or ten or twenty or fifty, is completely foreign to, to the text itself as, as far as the main statement being made. Rather, the emphasis is on him being God alone. Don't follow the other gods. Don't follow the other gods. Yahweh alone, who is one God, the only one that we worship. But, but let's, let's just say that the most common traditional interpretation, although as I said, there, there are Jewish traditions that read it as alone, understand it to mean that one alone. Even the New Jewish version renders it like that. But let's go with the understanding that he is echad, that he is one. Well, what does that word in and of itself mean? Well, the first time it's used is in Genesis, the first chapter, Yom Echad, day one or, or one day, and that's evening and morning make up one day. So evening and morning make up one day. The two components to the one day, correct? Then it's used in Genesis, the, the second chapter, for, for our next prominent usage, and it, and it talks about Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, and the two come together and the two become Echad, you've got it. So the two coming together are Echad. So it's one couple united, echad. You have, for example, the instructions of the, of the building of the tabernacle. For example, Exodus 36, 13, among other places, God instructs Moses to join the many pieces of the tabernacle together so that will be echad, one. The many different pieces of the tabernacle join together as one, echad. So as we see that, we, we see the word in and of itself does not speak of an absolute singularity. And, and, and the word itself does not speak of a compound unity. It means one like our English word means one. So if I say God is complex in his unity, or, 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 or the two become one, Adam and Eve become one, or the different pieces of the tabernacle become one, or morning and evening make one day, it's, it's not telling me the, the meaning of one in its essence, whether it's an absolute singularity or, or compound or complex unity. So with all my heart and soul, I believe that God is echad. I, I worship no one outside of God. I think of no one for adoration outside of God. I don't worship anyone or anything created. I worship the one eternal God, period. The question is, how does he make himself known? The question is, how does he reveal himself? Uh, because think of it. He's eternal. We are finite. He's, he, is, he is eternal, I should say we are temporal. He's infinite, we are finite. He is transcendent and spiritual, we, we are earthly, earthbound, fleshly. How do we relate? How does he communicate? How does he make himself known? Now what's interesting is that as we dig into the Hebrew Scriptures, we see passages indicating that no one can see God. No one can see his face and live. And, and he tells Israel, you didn't see any form when you saw me on Mount Sinai. But then we have other passages that speak of Moses seeing the form of the Lord. Or, or of Israelites seeing God. It doesn't say in a vision. They, they saw God. You know the New Testament teaches in several different places, in John 1 and John 5 and 1 Timothy 6, that no one's ever seen God, no one can see God. And yet Yeshua says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Hmm. How can this be? Let's, let's sort this out. Let's sort this out. The Hebrew scriptures often speak of God as Elohim. That's a plural form. Eloah, Elohim. Eloah, singular, Elohim, plural. 
God is spoken of as plural. Does that mean that he is a trinity? Well, it could mean that, but not necessarily, because in the Semitic languages, when you wanted to speak of power or majesty or ownership or lordship or complexity, you could speak of it in the plural. So you can even speak of, of an earthly master or earthly ruler as Adonim, plural. Uh, and and you, 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 you can speak of compassion, mercy, that's Rachamim, plural. Or face, Panim, plural. So that's just a Semitic expression. It's in keeping with God as complex unity, but doesn't prove it. To say Elohim is used to speak of God doesn't prove his complex unity, but it's in harmony with it. But it, however, it's a Semitic way of expressing power, greatness, majesty, etc., intensity. What about the verses like Genesis 1, Nase Adam Tzalmenu Kibbutenu? Let us make Adam man in our image according to our likeness. God speaking, let us make. Genesis 11, let us go down and, and see. Isaiah 6, who, who will go for us? Who will we send? God speaking. When he says we, is he speaking of Father, Son, and Spirit? It's possible, but you can't prove it. There could be other potential explanations of the, the verbal forms or how they're used or what's being said. Now, there's debate about this, but to say it proves God's training or your complex unity, no, it doesn't. Is it in harmony with it? Yes. Could it point to it? Yes. Does it prove it? No. But there are other things that, that we see in Scripture th that are very, very interesting. And, and we see that, that, that God who is invisible makes himself visible. That, that God who is transcendent comes in a way that we can see him and touch him. Several things. The Hebrew Bible states that no one can see God. And yet at times it says the people saw him. Who did they say? The Hebrew Bible speaks of God occasionally manifesting himself on the earth, apparently in human form. Yet as God, he sits enthroned in the highest heavens. How can both of these things be true? The Hebrew Bible sometimes describes the Holy Spirit as a personal being and not just as an impersonal force. Is the Holy Spirit merely a synonym for God or does the term describe part of his very nature, his own spirit? The Hebrew Bible makes reference to God's word as a concrete entity worthy of praise sent on divine missions and active in the world. What is meant by this word? If you take a good look uh, at, at scriptural text on this, and then the Aramaic textual traditions and the Targum that speak of the Memra, oh, it'll start to open up. We'll, we'll get to that. Don't want to confuse you there. We'll get to that. Look at this. The, the rabbis, the Talmudic rabbis, spoke of the Shekhinah. It represents some of the motherly female aspects of God, but it's God's earthly presence. God manifesting himself here on the earth. Some rabbinic tradition says the Shekhinah went into exile with God and that God will not be completely whole again until the Jews return from exile, temple rebuilt, all those things. Then there will be internal wholeness because part of God, in a sense, goes into exile with his people. Doesn't God sit enthroned in the heavens, transcendent? Yes, but in a sense, he comes and identifies with us and, and works among us. Rabbi Akiva, famous second century rabbi, late first, early second century rabbi, said that according to the scriptures, when God redeemed his people, he had, as it were, redeemed himself. Why? Because his Shekhinah, his divine presence, went into exile with his people. And then some Hasidic Jews joining the concept of the Shekhinah with the mystical concept of the Sfirot, which we'll come to in a moment, uh, took this one step further. They believed and still believe that, quote, the purpose of the performance of the mitzvot, the commandments, is to help the Shekhinah to unite with the Tiferet, the Sfirah, or, or emanation of glory and beauty, the male principle. The sins of Israel hinder this union and prevent the reunification of the world, which is a necessary prerequisite for the coming of God's kingdom. The Hasidim, in accordance with this belief, adopted the formula, much deplored by their opponents, for the sake of the unification of the Holy One, blessed be he and his Shekhinah, which they recited before the performance of the mitzvot. Whoa! God is complex in his unity, even in these Jewish traditions. Now, now, here is something fascinating. Book of Revelation, last book in the New Testament. It, it says that Yeshua 
sat down with the Father on his throne. What does that mean? Revelation 3.21. Revelation 4.2, John in a vision sees a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. It was the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. But then he sees a lamb representing Yeshua standing in the center of the throne, Revelation 5, 6. And then he hears a, a word calling for every creature on earth, or every creature on earth says these things, cries out to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. So to God and to Jesus, oh, are they two separate entities? Who's on the throne? How does it work? What? Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. John sees a multitude standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. Hmm. Revelation 7, 10, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Revelation 5, 6, 7, 17, the Lamb is at the center of the throne. Revelation 22, 1, there's a river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. But notice it's one throne, the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now look at this. Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, the new Jerusalem, and his servants will serve him. What? Well, did you catch that? The throne, one throne, of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his, not there, his servants will serve him. Not them. They will see his face, not their faces, and his name, not their names, will be on their foreheads. The New Testament explicitly speaks of one God, one God only. Oh, one God and one God only, complex in his unity, who in the person of his son comes into this world to make God known while the Father, the creator of all, sits on his heavenly throne and by his spirit fills the universe and by his spirit touches us right here where we live. One God, one God only. Uh, let me just give you a very earthly illustration, an earthly illustration. The physical sun, S-U-N, not the sun as in son of God, S-O-N. The sun, I understand that when we look at it, we don't actually see the core of it. The, the, the literal brightness is, is too bright to even see and look at. It is hidden, basically. What we see is the this, this shining forth of that. And then it's the invisible rays that touch us here on the earth. It provides a picture, a window of understanding for us into the nature of God. The Father, identified as the source of all things. We're talking about one physical Son, one God. Revealed to us as Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father, the source of all things, is hidden. Cannot be seen in His majesty and glory. Too bright. He manifests himself to us, makes himself known, this one God, through his son, Yeshua. The son proceeds forth from the Father. This is how God reveals himself to us. Proceeds forth from the Father. And Yeshua, the son, is the one who makes him known. That's why he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then, and then, from there, the Holy Spirit, invisible, Ruach HaKodesh, invisible, working among us on the earth, touches and heals and convicts us of our sin and draws us to God. Then it leads then to, in a sense, an equally big Jewish objection. There is, number one, the objection that we Jews worship one God, not three, and we say we Jewish followers of Jesus worship one God, not three. One God who is complex in his unity. But then we will be told, well, then if you are saying that the Son is divine, and that Jesus is the Son, then you are committing the worst type of idolatry. You're making God into a man, or you're making a man into a God. That's the worst type of idolatry. What's written in Numbers 23? Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man, that he should lie, nor a son of man, nor a human being, that he should change his mind. A similar statement in 1 Samuel 15, he's, he's not a man, that he they would lie or change his mind. You say God is a man? That's idolatry. No, no, here's what we say. This is what we say. We believe that the eternally preexistent Son of God, through whom the universe was made, came forth from God his Father and was clothed with human flesh, making himself known to us as Yeshua the Messiah. He lived on this earth. He died. He rose from the dead. He returned to his Father. 
He now sits enthroned in heaven next to God. We understand that Jesus, the Son of God, is the very image of God, the one in whom God caused his fullness to dwell, the one through whom he revealed himself completely to mankind. Since the Son came forth from the Father and shares his divine nature, in one sense, it is quite correct to say that Jesus is God or divine or deity. Always bearing in mind that the overwhelming testimony of the New Testament writings is that Jesus is the Son of God. I can show you from the Hebrew scriptures that there's absolutely nothing idolatrous about what we believe. God has always revealed himself to his people. He did it most permanently and most fully through Jesus, his son. I was fascinated to read what a Jewish professor had to say. Uh, he's a professor of, of Bible and Semitic languages at the Jewish Theological Seminary, Professor Benjamin Summer. And he talked about this issue of God's triunity according to Christian teaching. And it's quite extraordinary what he had to say. Now, uh, let's understand this. He's not a, an ultra-Orthodox Jew, an Orthodox Jew. He's a conservative Jew. But he is certainly fluent in traditional Jewish sources and Jewish thinking. And, and listen, listen to what he had to say about this concept. And, and uh, I just want to read the, the exact quote to you. He, he lays this out. Well, I'll, I'll just give you the gist of it right now to simplify. He says this, and, and then I want to read a very specific quote from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Schneerson. Professor Summer said this, the idea of a God having a body, in other words, he manifests himself in, in human form, and having a spirit, what Christians would refer to as the Trinity, is thoroughly Jewish. There's nothing un-Jewish about it, and that shouldn't scandalize us. He said, no, we reject Christianity for the following reasons, and I think we have a good answer. I know we do to all those following reasons. But in point of fact, is, is, as Jews, there's no problem believing these things. They're in harmony with the Hebrew Scripture, and they're in harmony with Jewish tradition. As for Echad, listen to this. According to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he died, of course, in 94. Echad means one. The Shema proclaims the oneness and unity of God, which the people of Israel are charged to reveal in the world, and which will be fully manifest in the era of Mashiach. But is Echad the ideal world, word to express the divine unity? Like its English equivalent, the word does not preclude the existence of other objects, as in the sequence one, two, three, nor does it preclude its object being composed of parts. We speak of one nation, one forest, one person, and one tree, despite the fact that each of these consists of many units or components. It would seem that the term yachid, which means singular and only one, more clearly expresses the perfect simplicity of God, which Maimonides states to be the most fundamental principle of the Jewish faith, and the axiom that there is none else beside him. Deuteronomy 4. Hasidic teaching explains that on the contrary, echad represents a deeper unity than yachid. Yachid is a oneness that cannot tolerate plurality, if another being or element is introduced into the equation, the yachid is no longer yachid. Echad, on the other hand, represents the fusion of diverse elements into a harmonious whole. The oneness of echad is not undermined by plurality. Instead, it employs plurality as the ingredients of unity. Now, he may have been thinking in pantheistic terms and nature involved and the unity of God. The point is what he says about echad is what I'm saying about echad. And to quote from Professor Summer, some Jews regard Christianity's claim to be a monotheistic religion with grave suspicion, both because of the doctrine of the Trinity, how can three equal one, and because of Christianity's core belief that God took bodily form. No Jew sensitive to Judaism's own classical sources, however, can fault the theological model Christianity employs when it avows belief in a God who has an earthly body as well as a Holy Spirit and a heavenly manifestation. For that model, we have seen in this book, is a perfectly Jewish one, a religion whose scripture contains the fluidity traditions, meaning God appearing in bodily form at different times and places, whose teachings emphasize the multiplicity of the Shekhinah, and whose thinkers speak of the Sephirot, the divine emanations, does not differ in its theological essentials, essentials from religion that adores the triune God. So says a Jewish seminary professor. All right. We are going to continue with how Yeshua, the Son, is in no way idolatry, but rather the full reflection of the image of God in the Hebrew Scriptures. 
our offers on this program, the best of Dr. Brown's Jewish debates. Join Dr. Michael Brown in three of his best debates and travel along on the journey of discovery as truth is laid out in these powerful DVDs. Watch as Messianic Jewish scholar Dr. Michael Brown, Orthodox Rabbi Shmuley Botea, and Rabbi Michael Gold argue for two very different interpretations of Scripture in these fast-moving debates. These presentations will provide you with information that will help you answer the questions, Is Jesus the promised Messiah or not? Is Jesus kosher? And did Jesus really die for our sins? For your tax-deductible gift of $40 or more, Michael would like to send you these three DVD presentations. Did Jesus die for our sins? Jesus, Messiah or not? And kosher Jesus? Build your faith and learn how to effectively witness to the Jewish people as you learn about the hard questions surrounding the identity of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and much more. These presentations will be a treasure to you and your family for years to come. Also, please visit our website or call and ask how you can receive access to our countless free resources. Learn exciting information on what is happening around the world and with our ministry today. When you visit our website, be sure to check out our bookstore for the latest videos, books, and more. You you may want to join us during an upcoming radio broadcast. Please contact us today for more information. Please remember, this ministry depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. Well, thank you for tuning in this week. I, I really hope that you were edified, that your eyes were open, that your faith was built. Look, let's face it, our Jewish friends have some serious theological questions about faith in Jesus, whether it's we can't believe that a man is a God or don't you Christians believe in three gods or whether it's the whole atonement system and blood sacrifice and we don't need the blood of a man. So that's what we're tackling these weeks on answering your toughest questions. I want to encourage you to join me week by week because we're going to keep unfolding these objections, going deeper into scriptures and Jewish tradition. If you missed any broadcast, just go to my website, askdrbrown.org. You can catch up on all the, the broadcasts there. And if you're a Jewish person watching and you've got questions, please let us know. We'd love to help you. Ask drbrown.org and make sure to tune into next week's episode as we continue to tackle theological objections to the faith. This has been a paid program made possible by financial contributions to Ask Dr. Brown Ministries from viewers like you in your area. Thank you for your support.